All right, welcome to our new folks. We are just getting started and waiting for folks to join. So we have about 24 participants and we are so happy to have you here. We're gonna wait just a few minutes and everyone is muted, but feel free to use the chat to say hello. Okay, I think we're ready. Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Tony. I'm so happy you're here. Um, we put together this week's SQL workshop because we know there's a lot of questions and a lot of uh, confusion going on around this issue. And we wanted to share with you our thinking, um, know what we know about SQL and um, kind of what's going on on the ground in the Emerald Triangle. So, this is our agenda for today. Um, our main driving question is what is CEQA and how can cannabis businesses navigate the process? Um, we just did our arrive in Zoom and introductions. You can feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, tell us a little bit about why you're here. And we're going to launch into a CEQA overview and our 21 areas of interest and in how cultivators can navigate the CEQA process. And then at two o'clock, around two, we'll have a Q&A. And we hope to answer your questions and get some clarity around CEQA. But first, um, why are we qualified to present a CEQA workshop? Um, we are environmental consultants and really policy wonks that are very data driven in what we're doing and we love to help uh, buyers and investors and operators get licensed, understand land use policy, how, um, you know, different environmental impacts on their projects and um, get people licensed and staying licensed and stay compliant. Um, this is our team. Scott Watkins is an MPP MBA, a licensed contractor. Rachel is our senior project manager there in the tiles. And then there's Patrick, our um, project manager and planner. And I'm Tony, a project analyst. Also on our team, we have Antoinette, Justina, and Emily, who really make all the wheels go round and make sure we are moving forward as a business. So that is us. Uh, we are based in Trinity County. We have an office in Hayfork and an office in Weaverville. And that's a little bit about us. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Rachel, Scott, and Patrick, who are going to talk a little bit about what is CEQA. So go ahead, Scott. I'm going to ask you to unmute. I'm going to unmute the three of you. Are we good? Yep. So CEQA okay. is an acronym for the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, on the next couple slides, there's a quick CEQA overview in 30 seconds. The California Environmental Quality Act was passed under Governor Reagan in 1970. Um, CEQA is required for all construction projects. If it's not required, it's statutorily exempt or categorically exempt, and we'll get into that later. So for cannabis projects, cannabis com or compliance for CEQA is required by July 1st. 2021, which is coming up sooner than we anticipated. So we're going to go 
through the 21 components of CEQA. Um, and so CEQA, what it is, is it's a disclosure of impacts based on a project. So this is neither positive nor negative. Um, often these documents come off as somewhat conservative and negative because it's a disclosure of impacts. And CEQA is mostly enforced through litigation. There are some really infamous cases like Planned Parenthood being sued because they didn't disclose the noise impacts of their protesters. Um, so it's this really interesting machine to disclose projects. So CEQA history, it was on the next slide, CEQA was adopted by California in 1970. It's loosely based on the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, which was signed into President Nixon several months earlier. California actually started CEQA before NEPA was put in place, but it was kind of this race to get these environmental documents in. So before CEQA and NEPA, agencies would take a one to two point approach. So let's pretend they wanted to build a road they would say point A to point B, and really there was no other consideration other than cost and feasibility to get to point A to point B. NEPA and CEQA provide environmental components on an equal basis as cost and timeliness. So I'm going to pass on to Scott for the next slide. Yeah, <clears throat> welcome. Uh, thank you, Rachel. I just want to start off by saying I cannot stand CEQA. I think we need to re- oh, there we go. That's the right slide. I can't stand CEQA. As Rachel mentioned a second ago, it's highly litigated. Um, it's, it's really squishy in that there's no real 100% you have to do it one way. It's really open to interpretation. And so the kind of the math guy in me just can't stand that. So um, there's one uh, guideline that I just want to read real quick and it kind of sets the table and tells you exactly why I feel that way. It says um, an environmental document should be prepared with a sufficient degree of analysis to provide decision makers with the information which enables them to make a decision which intelligently takes into account uh, the environmental consequences of that action. Um, the evaluation of the environmental effects of a proposed project need not be exhaustive, but the sufficiency of an environmental document is to be reviewed in the light of what is reasonably feasible. Disagreement among experts, experts does not make an EIR or environmental document inadequate, but the environmental document should summarize the main points of disagreement among experts. The courts have not looked for perfection, but for adequacy, completeness, and a good faith effort at full disclosure. So it's that good faith effort, um, I think is the most important part. And in this flow chart, you know, this, this is kind of the path that projects need to go through. Um, at the top, you can see uh, they kick out potentially to um, a categorical exemption. Um, if they're not exempt, then they flow through these other kind of buckets. Uh, typically, the lead agency would be the local jurisdiction. Um, but in, uh, in reality, often local jurisdictions, they're uh, understaffed and overworked. And so folks like us kind of help a project get a little bit quicker approval process by taking on the environmental analysis, which is then reviewed and edited by that lead agency. And in the next slide, um, it really breaks down kind of in a little bit easier to follow fashion, a typical process. So the categorical exemptions are always the first step. You know, you want to qu qualify for a categorical exemption. It's the fastest, cheapest and lightest way to get a project approved. Um, there's 30 something, I think 33 different categorical exemption categories, but really only five of them apply to cannabis. Um, that would be a class one existing conditions, which is, you know, that's the prize. That's what you want. Existing conditions, you fly through the approval process. Class two replacement or reconstruction, not seeing those as much for cannabis. Class three non-construction or conversion, also not that's not a, a typical one that we use a lot. The class four minor alterations to land is typically for grading and things like that. We, we see that a lot. And then the, the fifth one would be a class 11 accessory structures. Um, we use mostly class one and class four uh, for most of our projects, but you can also pair up some of these categorical exemptions. You can do a class one, class four, and class 11 
to really get your whole project through. It's all about the development pattern. So whatever project you're proposing, it's a, that's a pattern of development. So um, when you don't qualify for a categorical exemption, the natural next step is the initial study. And that's typical in most jurisdictions for almost all cannabis activities. Uh, Trinity County is a little bit unique. Um, so uh, it doesn't, it hasn't required an initial, initial study, uh, especially for cultivation, but that we feel that the winds are changing on that, um, which is kind of why we're, we're doing this today. Now, uh, initial studies can have a negative declaration or a mitigated negative declaration. The negative declarations are really hard. Uh, we don't see those as many. Typically, there's at least one mitigation measure uh, that's imposed. And mitigation means to reduce or lessen your environmental impact. So you propose a project, there's a mitigation measure that says, okay, uh, you're gonna do X, Y, and Z if something happens so that you reduce your, your, your impact. So we see a lot of cultural resources requiring um, a mitigation measure, but odor, air quality, those are other ones that usually require some type of mitigation measure. Um, when you're writing or evaluating uh, your initial study, it's really based on the overall project as it's proposed. Um, I'm gonna get into that in one second. Um, before I do, let me run you through the rest of this list. If you do an initial study on a proposed project, and you find out, you know what, there are environmental impacts that there's no way we can come up with um, a suitable mitigation measure, then that project may push into that deeper um, environmental analysis, which would be an EIR. So EIRs can be for projects, but they can also be for programs. So um, the projects will set that aside. That's usually a large project or something that's really unique. Uh, for programmatic EIRs, your, the state of California mandates that all of these cannabis programs, they have a programmatic EIR. And with that, they kind of, the, a jurisdiction can create a big umbrella that a lot of projects fall underneath. And then they create what's called a tiering checklist, kind of like the Cal Cannabis Appendix J, where you just sort of buzz through this checklist. And if you meet all of the, or if you meet or you're underneath all of the thresholds of significance, then uh, your project is covered under that programmatic EIR. If you don't meet those thresholds of significance, then that lo local jurisdiction could have you do that initial study and potentially uh, a full uh, project level EIR. Some of the exa example jurisdictions that we're gonna talk about throughout this presentation are our own backyard, Trinity County, which is currently in a draft environmental impact report. So there's a draft and then there's uh, the final or certified um, EIR. Humboldt County and Mendocino County uh, are already have a certified EIR. So that's why they're considered a PEIR or programmatic environmental impact report. Sometimes people say final environmental impact report. That's all pretty much interchangeable. I'm sure that that other folks might might be able to, to create the, or delineate the nuances between those, but essentially they're the same thing. Now all of these CEQA analysis or compliance documents that's what all these typically are, are called. They all require some level of public noticing. And that's the thing about CEQA is, you know, you go through your public noticing, you do all this great work, you design a great project, and then someone from the public can hijack your project. I know of one uh, project down in uh, the Bay Area where um, it was litigated because there were no prevailing wage jobs. Well, prevailing wage jobs aren't part of uh, CEQA compliance, but the unions um, in this case said we want prevailing wage jobs and they found something within your environmental analysis and they, they sued based on that. So, you know, these, the CEQA compliance documents can get hijacked. They can get um, misappropriated. And um, so you really need to make sure you have a really tight analysis. Um, typically those, uh, something gets noticed and then it gets appealed. And so through that appeal process, you could get kicked into a public hearing of course, if you're writing an initial study for a conditional use permit, then likely you're gonna have some level of public hearing, typically with the planning commission. And then lastly, uh, the ultimate goal is to get that whatever um, analysis uh, document certified, um, which typically is about 30 days. So hopefully you followed along with all that, uh, but don't worry, we're, we're here, we're gonna help you through the process. And on the next slide, um, I'll talk a little bit more about initial studies. What are the components? First is the project description. 
The project description is the most important part of your initial study. That's where you describe, you kind of set a baseline and a glass ceiling for the full project to build out. So um, in your baselines, you look at the existing conditions and you describe them, your historical setting, you describe how the property was used in the past and what sort of legacy environmental impacts might exist. And you may need to clean those up. Um, we have seen that uh, with a, a recent lumber mill project we worked on um, where there were some environmental stuff and, and the, the applicant and the person that's developing the project now is now responsible for that environmental cleanup. But there's also the environmental setting. You know, you look at the transportation network, your visual setting, um, and you, just, you describe all this stuff. You describe your access to the utilities, whether that's electrical or sewage or water supply from a, a municipal district. Um, and then you describe in your proposed uses, uh, the project development and timeline, uh, the schedule, if it's phased out over years, sometimes depending on the project, or sometimes there is just one phase, you know, you build it and you use it. Um, then you also uh, describe potential traffic impacts, parking, water availability, water use, any conservation measures, and also wastewater discharge. So all those components we're going to dive into and talk a little bit about when you actually get to the analysis. So you write your project description and that's what you analyze is your project description using the 2021 20, different um, categories that we're going to go over in a minute. Now here's the other part. It's really important that your initial study uh, is based on the technical documents that have been written for your project. So your bio and your archaeology, cultural resources, those are mandatory. Those are required by professionals that meet a certain standard. But then there's other like optional kind of, you can think of it as uh, technical documents that your local jurisdiction may require you to produce, like a traffic study, a noise study, um, which is similar to a sound study. Uh, then there's the aesthetic, aesthetic assessment. Um, I recently read a hydrology assessment uh, for a project in the county of Alameda. Um, I do some of my best learning just by reading uh, other documents around the state. I, I read them from San Diego all the way up here to Trinity um, whenever I have spare time. It's, it's a great way to, to learn how other people are approaching it. And I, I think that's a great starting point for a lot of folks. But going back to that biological resource assessment, so that's kind of your, your initial um, assessment. But there can also be like a bat study, an owl study, a prickly sna uh, snail study. It can get pretty deep depending on the characteristics of the land. All of these uh, CEQA compliance documents and the analysis are specific to the project at a specific location. So I think that that's also really important. Um, and on the next slide, uh, it's probably maybe what you're thinking in your mind when you when you see all this stuff. You're like, wow, this is like spaghetti. Um, but we're going to try to straighten all this stuff out for you and, and try to make it a little bit easier to, to kind of understand all the components. Tony? Right. Yeah, I'm going to break in with a poll question that I'm dropping in the chat, which is essentially how familiar is CEQA to you? One being not at all familiar, and 10 is very familiar with CEQA. We have a CEQA expert in the house. So we'll go ahead and wait a little minute for your responses. We got it two to three, four, good, four, six. I feel like I'm at a six and this is my job. So <laughs> that's great. Uh, here we go. Five, seven. Cool. So it seems like we have kind of a middle of the road. People have heard about CEQA, maybe understand a little bit about what it is. Um, but obviously you're all here because you have questions about how CEQA is going to impact your cannabis projects or you're curious to learn more. So we're happy to share what we know. Thanks to everyone who participated in the chat. We'll have another poll question in just a minute, but right now I'm gonna pass it over to Patrick for our 21 areas of interest. Thanks, Tony. So we're gonna go through these for three to four at a time, kind of break them down for you, see how they, uh, they need to be analyzed and how it could affect your environmental analysis. So let's jump right in. So the first, uh, the first area of analysis is the aesthetics area. And the key question to ask for aesthetics 
is does the project impact the visual character of its surroundings? If you can answer in an affirmative to that question, then you might need to modify construction plans. Um, you might need to reuse an existing building that's already established in the location of your project or an existing uh, site reuse. Uh, there's also differences between uh, urban aesthetics and rural aesthetics. Uh, in rural areas, you might need to modify the way you build a building to be more in line with surrounding areas. It could even be as detailed as changing the color of a roof to be more in line with surrounding areas. As far as ag forestry resources, are you removing trees? Are you converting timberland to agriculture land? Is your project in prime farmland? And prime farmland is kind of treated differently from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. In Humboldt County, I know that as far as cannabis, it's actually encouraged to be in prime farmland, but there may be jurisdictions where prime farmland wants to be uh, conserved. So they may, you may need to move your project. On the next slide, we can look at air quality. Um, that could be PM, which is particulate matter, uh, 2.5 and 10, and that's the actual physical size of the particles. So PM 2.5 is uh, exhaust and uh, emissions from automobiles. PM 10 is like dust from, uh, from dirt roads. And air quality is analyzed differently from each air quality management district. So up here, we're in the North Coast Air Basin, but down in the Bay Area, Southern California, uh, it might be interpreted differently. And some air basins are very large. Uh, I know that the air basin from Kern County encompasses the desert area to the east, but then also um, to Bakersfield or San Bernardino. You know, that's a, it's a pretty large city and it's all within the same air basin. So there can be some different um, ways that you need to analyze your impacts uh, based on where you're located within the air basin itself. As far as biological resources, you can go one back, Tony. As far as biological resources, that's a little bit more cut and dry, I would say. Uh, as Scott referred to the technical documents that are required for your project, at least as far as cannabis, um, if, a, if a biologist comes to your site and finds um, a northern spotted owl habitat or marbled murrelet or any other type of endangered species or sensitive species or plant, you're going to need to relocate your project on a different part of your of your property. And if you're buying a property, you might want to consider a different property that's not as heavily affected from biological resources. On the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about cultural resources. And I'd say that's similar to biological resources, but analysis for cultural resources goes a little bit more broad because you, uh, you may need to consult with Native American tribes. Um, you may need to consult with archeological experts that know the area. They can do records requests from various cultural databases around the state. Um, the one that's commonly used is in Chico at the Ch Chico State University. And those records requests can turn up historical archeological assessments that have been done that may have determined that um, oh, there's historically a Native American village here. There might be um, evidence. You might need to relook at your project. On the next slide, I'll hand it over to Rachel to talk about energy. Thank you, Patrick. So energy in terms of cannabis actually revolves around the Jurisdiction's Renewable Energy Plan and the Clean Energy Act. And it can possibly pull from their EIR. So in this section, you're going to be using Cal EE Mod, which is a tool to disclose. There's air quality, energy, greenhouse gases. Cal EE Mod is used throughout your initial study. Um, and what Cal EE Mod does is they have a database of baselines, project descriptions that model to give you a reasonably accurate result for a wide range of projects. So this is more typical CEQA. So this could be industrial, agricultural. So it doesn't really match up with cannabis use. So on this section, you have to actually get a little more creative and try and figure out what energy consumption your greenhouses and your processing buildings are gonna be using. Um, so there's a lot of regulation that you're gonna be pulling from and then you're gonna be trying to find 
the data from your actual project. On the next section, geology and soils, for cannabis stuff is mostly for hazards from slope, faults, erosion, earthquakes. This really applies to new structures and septic systems. Um, if you're in a sewer district, maybe this isn't as big of a deal, but septic systems are very um, mainstream up in Northern California area. It's mostly what's used. So if a potential soil type is not supportive of that, then maybe your project wouldn't be approved in that area and maybe it needs to be moved over or some other mitigation measure introduced. On the next slide is the greenhouse gas emissions. So this is one of the very interesting parts of CEQA and specifically for cannabis. It really relies on your jurisdiction and your air quality district. Um, so the, we're in the North Coast Unified Air Quality District. So there's some areas that aren't measured very well and are technically in compliance, but they're not measured, so do we know? Um, so for the North Coast, they have Rule 110 thresholds, which are very high. They're meant for industrial use, mining, lumber. Um, so typically cannabis activities will fall under those thresholds. Uh, if it doesn't, usually it's in the particle matter 10 from roads as a huge factor out in these rural communities. If you're in a more urban setting, maybe it's your particle matter 2.5 from emissions and you have to edit your fleet of vehicles and go more electric. Um, so greenhouse gas emissions can, it's really reliant on the air quality management district. Um, some districts like the Bay Area, they have a certain footprint of um, area that you can expand to and you're underneath their threshold. So the next section is hazard and hazardous materials. So for cannabis, you're gonna be using pesticides, fertilizers, petroleum products for those tools you're gonna to be using. So it's gonna fall under the health and safety code, your local jurisdiction circulation element and safety elements and your general plan. Um, how are you getting your products to and from these sites? Um, in addition, you're going to be relying heavily on the State Water Board's Cannabis General Order, the Department of Pesticide Regulation, the local health department, the local Ag Commissioner's Office all regulate pesticides. Um, so it's pulling a lot of information from that and then what are you logistically using on site? For cannabis, there's a very select amount of pesticides you can use and it's a pretty narrow scope. So that actually really helps in writing this section. Um, but still, you're going to be limited on a lot of sizing and volume of these products. Um, another part of the section is the Department of Toxic Control can jump in, especially in the Northern California area where mining was very popular. There's old mill sites, old gas stations that have buried gas tanks and other infrastructure that has since faded in these communities, but are legacy issues. Um, so there's also in this section, in some of these rural communities, you have airport and small airstrips. Um, so you could be in an airport overlay zone, um, which would end up being in this section. Um, also in this section is wildfire, which is really important in today's environment. Um, who's your responsible fire agency? Is it your local volunteer fire department? Is it Cal Fire? How is CAL FIRE coming into these hazard and hazardous materials issues? Um, on to the next section on the next slide is the hydrology and water quality section. So again, this relies on the State Water Board Cannabis Order and then fit the Department of Fish and Wildlife jumps in and uses their regulations as well on top of their 1600 permitting. Um, so depending on your project, water can severely limit your project in scope and location especially with the state water board setbacks, you may have to move your project over to an area that is less ideal. There are some exemption processes for fully enclosed greenhouses with impermeable floors. Um, but again, that's in another review step. It's easier to set yourself outside of those setbacks. Um, in terms of project scope, seeing what water you have for cannabis cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, et cetera. Um, what activities are you gonna run on your site? How much water is that gonna use? How much water do you have available? So in a water scarce area, if you have a groundwater well, 
in a rain catchment pond and a rain catchment system on your processing buildings, that may be enough to get you to your project threshold. Is that really going to work on your project ground level? So this section is really trying to figure out what your needs are, what's available, and what can you do to make it work. And sometimes it doesn't and you have to scale your project down. Um, the next section is the land use and planning component. Um, so do you comply with your cannabis ordinance? I want to back, back it up. Back yeah. it up. <laughs> there, there we go. Um, do you comply with your cannabis ordinance, your zoning ordinance, setbacks, ingress, egress, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Environmental Health, your building department? So like this land use planning can be a little complicated. It depends on your local jurisdiction. Um, sometimes there's weird zoning overlays, um, multiple zonings on a single parcel. So it really, it's your, your jurisdiction driving this section. Um, on the next slide is mineral resources. Again, Northern California, prominent mining communities. Sometimes there's still mining equipment on properties um, and it can be significant resources in unexpected locations. Um, there still are mining overlays. And again, it depends on your jurisdiction. Trinity County has um, a no-go list of zonings. Technically mining is in their allowable zoning component. So again, you're back to your, your historical resources and your local jurisdiction. Um, and then noise, so in a traditional sense, if you have a retail shop and you're in a residential neighborhood, you're talking about that level of noise. For cannabis, you're talking about your vehicles coming in and out of a property. Fans, backup generators, HVACs, pumps, all of this contributes to your noise generation and your noise environment. Um, so this can impact your sensitive users from schools to local homes. It could impact your biological resources component and it can and impact your land planning use. So a lot of like land planning has an acceptable decibel level at your property line. Um, so it can limit your pro project depending on what sensitive receptors are near you. So I'm gonna pass this off to Scott for the next slide. That was a great breakdown uh, both Patrick and Rachel just gave. Um, so population and housing uh, is an interesting one. Um, you know, I was on a site uh, yesterday or the day before, and they mentioned that they're going to have 40 people in for trim season. They, they try to get their trimming done in about a two week period so they can get to market quicker. Well, that influx of, uh, of trimmers, that's kind of what the population and housing is thinking about as far as cannabis goes. So, um, you know, they're, they're thinking, are you going to displace current, uh, the current population with new folks coming in uh, that are affiliated with your project? Is there unplanned growth uh, that's going to happen? So in Trinity County, you're required to have a house or a residential dwelling on every cultivation site. Um, how does that play with the population and housing? Um, and then back to those, uh, the temporary workers, you know, are there farm labor quarters? Is there temporary housing that goes up? All of that type of stuff is addressed under the population and housing. Um, the next section would be public services. Uh, would your project result in like a substantial adverse physical impact? That's what they, that's the technical term that they put in the checklist. Um, but that really essentially means, are you gonna have a, a higher demand for public services? Is there going to be a higher need for, uh, for police and fire protection um, that's going to uh, influence the acceptable service ratios? So how, what that means is how long does it take the police to get to you? If, uh, your, is your project going to create a higher demand for their services? If so, you might need a, some kind of uh, mitigation measure to kind of offset that, whether that's on-site security, whether that's... Uh, you know, sometimes it's a development agreement uh, between the local jurisdiction and the um, project applicant where you provide funding to fund two more police officers so that the uh, service ratios can remain the same. Um, on the next slide is uh, recreation. Um, recreation in a, in a rural um, setting is, it's kind of a throwaway section to be honest with you. There's not much impact when it's dispersed. But in an urban setting, 
you know, you may be adjacent to a recreation center and, you know, there may be impacts, you know, from uh, the change in, um, in use so that you have a higher volume of people coming in and out and that could create uh, impacts to recreation. Uh, the next one is transportation. And this is a really fun one. It's one that we struggled with this year. Um, and that's because uh, there was a major change in the um, uh, CEQA checklist uh, in 2020. And it, that the change specifically, there was a big one in transportation. On July 1st of 2020, um, the transportation metric that's used to analyze environmental impacts was changed from what's called level of service into vehicle miles traveled. Well, what does that mean? And how does that change the analysis? I, I know that I watched every single um, uh, OPR is the, the acronym, but the Governor's Office of Research and Planning, they held uh, weekly webinars. And so I think it was May or June, I was watching those every single week and watching the recordings and pulling them apart and trying to figure out how is this switch from LOS to VMT going to impact our analysis and uh, change the development pattern or the, the size of the proposed project and things like that. Fortunately, we had some major breakthroughs um, in, around um, the first or second week of July. We figured out an entire systematic approach to analyzing VMTs for the entire uh, cannabis supply chain. I'm really, really proud of the work that, um, that our whole team did in creating this breakthrough. Um, you know, we, we kind of look at the circulation system and, and look at the transit system, the roadway, bicycle, and pedestrian facilities to really make sure that each project is going to be compliant and not create um, a significant impact uh, by, their, by them being built out. But there's other things that are in the transportation section too, such as the geometric design of the roadways. So if you've got a project that's got a blind corner and you're gonna be now introducing a, a project that has more left turns rather than right turns, um, you, you might have to do a whole transportation or traffic study to figure out, okay, what's the geometric design? What's the, the speed of the vehicles? You know, you kind of get into this really deep analysis to verify that you're not gonna create hazards and there are not gonna be more car accidents. Um, also, there's um, emergency access, making sure that those police and those fire, they can get onto uh, the proposed project facility in a timely manner, and they're not going to have issues getting on there, you know, whether that's turnouts in a rural setting, whether that's uh, design features of a parking lot or something like that in an urban setting. All those things sort of kind of uh, fall underneath the transportation section. And I just want to reiterate this vehicle miles traveled, it's going to change a lot of projects around California. It's, it's not a brand new metric, but it's being used in a new way. And so this is, this is going to be a, a big stopper for a lot of things. You know, we, we had a lot of meetings with traffic engineers from around the state. I like to get a lot of opinions before we figure out a path forward. And so we, we had a lot, a lot of meetings. Um, trying to figure out, okay, what's this mean for projects going forward? And um, yeah, it's, it's good news that uh, it's, I, I, I think it's going to be an easier evaluation for vehicle miles traveled rather than LOS. LOS is just such a ridiculous metric. In any event, let's move on. Um, the next slide is tribal cultural resources. Typically, your archaeologist is doing your tribal cultural resources and looking at the California Register of Historic Resources and really looking into the Native American tribe impacts that could happen. Now, this is a delineation that's really important. Uh, AB 52 is a state policy that's referred to a lot in, in CEQA speak, where uh, all the tribes need to be notified that this project is going in because tribal resources are sensitive. And, you know, that's not public information because there's been a lot of really uh, awful things that have happened to tribal cultural resources where you have people going in there and digging them up and taking them home. And that's just not right. So there's some privacy concerns here. And while I mentioned earlier that, you know, we try to help applicants and, and developers develop their project and write their initial study for them. And, you know, we, we hire sub consultants when necessary. Uh, but per AB 52, the local jurisdiction, this is one area that we can't help out. The local jurisdiction has got to be the one that contacts the tribes directly. 
Um, so uh, it took us a minute to, to figure that out. I think that was a year or two. We, we figured out that little uh, hiccup there. We had been having our archaeologists do all of the outreach and, and the local jurisdiction was like, uh, 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 no, that, that's our space right there. So that's an interesting little fun fact from Uncle Scott's Almanac. Uh, utilities and service systems um, are another um, section. Um, typically, they're looking at new and expanded water or wastewater treatment. Um, they're looking at the stormwater drainage, uh, your electrical power, natural gas or telecom. Um, those are all uh, areas that you examine under this section. You know, they want to know, do you have sufficient water supplies? Going back to that hydrology, you know, thinking about your water demand. They want to know, uh, does the wastewater treatment have adequate capacity? Uh, as Rachel mentioned a few minutes ago with uh, geology, you know, you know what your soil types are and what their capacity is to absorb that wastewater. All that stuff is calculations that need to go into this, uh, this study. Um, typically, uh, folks like us are able to take on this type of work. In some jurisdictions, they require a specialist to do that hydrology study. Um, it really just depends. And, you know, it's another important point is you can't make assumptions. You know, you have to be able to back up any um, claims in an initial study with hard evidence and hard facts. So those technical documents are, are really important. But uh, the last piece in the utilities and service systems is solid waste generation, whether that's uh, recycling or household waste, if you've got a residential uh, dwelling on a cultivation um, uh, parcel and you're sharing uh, that property between a couple different uses, you know, how are you handling solid waste? Are you composting? Where are you composting? How big is it? You know, all those things sort of fall under this one bucket. And on the next slide is uh, one that another new category, um, if we could back up one, yeah, there we go. A uh, wildfire is now become its own section uh, under SQL. This is a, this is kind of a new one um, that came out with the uh, recent checklist update. Um, and I, I rightly so, as I think we can all agree, uh, wildfire is a growing concern, not just with fighting that fire, and, and putting it out in a timely manner, but also with the smoke. You know, I, I was looking at some, some maps last night and the smoke from the California fires is stretching over into the Detroit area in Michigan. So this is not just a local issue um, and the neighborhood issue. This is turning into uh, to a national issue. Um, so wildfire is its own thing. You know, do you have the adequate uh, infrastructure installed on a property to, to combat wildfire? I know that there's uh, mapping for ponds, for rainwater catchment ponds are being used by CAL FIRE if they need to dip their, their helicopter basket in to put out a fire. Um, you know, th those types of things are important. Uh, so I think that's a great community asset that cannabis can offer, especially in these remote areas. Now, the last one is kind of a fun one. Uh, it's, it's title is mandatory findings of significance, but most people call it cumulative impacts. And so it's I would say 20 or 21, it's kind of a little bit of, debate, of a debate because it, it is 20 distinct uh, items, uh, but then that 21st one is the cumulative impacts. And that's when you look not just at your project, your individual projects impact, but what about all the projects within that geographic area? They may be less than significant in isolation one at a time, but when you start thinking about 10 or 100, or in this picture, 1,000, uh, all within, you know, a one mile uh, area, which is what this image is. is this is Post Mountain in Trinity County. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of grows in a concentrated area. So while your hydrology, your groundwater well may produce enough water for your, um, your single cultivation, when you think of things in aggregate for taking into account all of your neighbors, punching in groundwater wells, or two, or sometimes three groundwater wells in order to meet those minimum gallon per minute thresholds, you know, that's what we're talking about here. Those are the cumulative impacts. So they, the cumulative impacts could be, um, you know, you're substantially reducing the habitat for fish or wildlife, something that, that Rachel mentioned a little earlier, uh, or you're uh, threatening to eliminate a plant or an animal community. We had a, um, a project in, uh, down in the Kenton Palm, Hentenshaw, Xenia area that had potential uh, tribal impacts, not just because there were arrowheads that could potentially be in the area, but that there were 
there was a sensitive plant species. So if the groundwater, if there's too many wells and too much of a draw, the, the groundwater could um, mean the elimination of wetlands and the elimination of that wetlands could impact a sensitive plant species. So it's thinking about things not only on the singular uh, individual project level, but again, on that sort of community minded uh, level. That's what the cumulative impacts are. And um, that, that can be a really interesting analysis, you know, thinking about all this stuff in aggregate. And on the next slide, uh, you know, here we are going through all this stuff and all you wanna do is grow a pretty flower, you know? Uh, but that's why we work in teams. Um, I'm allergic to the plants, but I'm not allergic to the paperwork. A lot of the, the folks that, I, that we work with, you know, they're great with the plants and maybe they are allergic to the paperwork. And, and that's why we team up with them to help them out where we can. Tony? Great. Yeah, so I just have a quick question in the chat, which is which CEQA area would you like to learn more about? We are hoping to offer more workshops in the future. So if there's any of these that you would like us to do a deeper dive on, I invite you to put that in the chat and we'll just take a little minute to wait for your responses. Hydrology is a good one. Some of impacts is huge. Some of impacts for sure. <laughs> Some of it's complicated. <laughs> it's really going to depend on your project. Yeah. Roads can get pretty complicated. I didn't know how complicated roads were until I started reading the Rural Roads Handbook. All right water odor mitigation we didn't really talk we didn't really touch upon odor which is more of a um, jurisdiction concern than a secret concern from my understanding underwater rights watersheds hydrology yes water policy in california is seriously complicated jared we agree uh cumulative, study. In, cumulative impacts yeah. on watersheds are also really complicated too yeah okay do um, I? Great. Well, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just reading the last one that came in. Do I need to do a sequel analysis? Most likely. It, you know, doing right. your own independent initial study um, could give your project more flexibility. So maybe you don't want to tuck under that EIR. Maybe you want to kind of claim your own freedom to do what you want a little bit more. So doing an initial study uh, for your own individual project could help you know, add some flexibility to, uh, to your operations and how you develop your property. So most likely you need to do your own SQL analysis. And that's what we're getting into right now with Patrick. Right, so as Scott kind of alluded to right there, um, in Trinity County, the programmatic EIR is in, in the process of being certified. And once it is certified, whenever that may be, the purpose of that document is to take care of environmental analysis for the cannabis program as a whole. So the point, the intent of completing that PEIR document is to be able to allow cultivators to develop their site within the specific um, requirements set down in the EIR. But once that's EIR is, is certified then cultivators will be able to develop however they want within that, within those guidelines. Um, or as Scott alluded to just a minute ago, you can sort of take environmental analysis and compliance into your own hands and prepare an initial study, um, which, which is seeming like that's the way that's going to give you more flexibility. It's going to be quicker, but uh, it's kind of your call but that's what we're gonna talk about uh, in the next few slides. So I'll hand it over to Rachel on the next slide. So we're gonna focus on a couple of different jurisdictions. Trinity County's our backyard, so we're gonna start with this one. So back in 2016, the program went into effect and in 2017, they tried to initiate their first environmental impact report. This fell through and they continued on and back in 2019, they picked it up again with a scent. So, which is on the next slide. 
So with Trinity County, this is kind of dicey because the, the EIR is not complete and the deadline is July of 2021. So by the time the EIR is ratified and notice of determination is made, and then they have to go through a whole ordinance rewrite because the EIR recommendations and components are then put into the local cannabis ordinance and then a project can tier off of that. So by the time that happens, most likely it will be past July of 2021, unless some absolute miracle can happen. So on the next slide, you can kind of see what Trinity County is doing currently in lieu of their EIR is they have categorical exemptions that they're issuing on a renewable basis. And so that's for a very narrow and specific um, description. And that's what Scott talked about earlier. On the other hand, if you go through and do an initial study, they provide you um, a number of conditions of approval. Here's a sample from a recent project that had 45 conditions. A lot of them were from state and local law, but some of them were more specific like moving a road or specific outdoor lighting types. Um, and then on the next slide is their provisional, which is you are in process of your CEQA document that you're going to provide to the county. So what's really interesting is if you have a categorical exemption, if their EIR is not in place, the categorical exemptions don't mean anything. You still have to do your own CEQA initial study. Provisionals, you still have to do your own CEQA initial study. So you're kind of back to, do you want to wait on this EIR or do you want to move on and do your own initial study to have some freedom with your project? Um, and that could include stacking of licenses on the same property, manufacturing, distribution, retail, et cetera. So on the next slide, I'm gonna talk about Mendo and Humboldt. So Mendocino and Humboldt both have final environmental impact reports. So Humboldt did a great job of taking that environmental impact report and taking those conditions and putting it into their ordinance. So they have a 600 foot cultural resources buffer. They have these really large buffers and pretty narrow zoning to make their EIR work with cannabis in their county. So their, most of their projects fall under their EIR without much work. Now Mendocino is right now in development of a tiering checklist with um, the Cal Cannabis to make their projects work and provide a notice of determination. So what's common through all three of these, prod all three of these um, programmatic EIRs is there are certain triggers that will kick you out of underneath their EIR and force you into an initial study. For Trinity County, it's looking like employee numbers and your grading size and if you're going to vertically integrate. For Humboldt, the cultural resources is a really big one and your construction size is a really big one. Um, so depending on what that, that initial study says and provides your glass ceiling, as long as you stay under that ceiling, you can stay underneath the EIR. So an example would be if the EIR says you can have up to 17 gallons of water per square foot per day, as long as you stay underneath that, you meet that criteria. And so for an EIR, for each criteria that's set, you need to meet all of them. Or if you can't meet them, you need to be able to mitigate. Um, and so once you can't really mitigate to their satisfaction, you need to do additional review and initial study. So I'm gonna pass off the next slide to Scott. Right back to that path in the road. Do you, do you take the commonly followed one or do you blaze your own trail? You know, it's, it's a really interesting question. Uh, the industry is in an interesting place. Um, there are a lot of EIRs out there that, you know, they, that's what cements a program in. Uh, in a local jurisdiction. Um, you typically only do one of these. You, you rarely see two of them. So you really wanna make sure that that programmatic EIR um, is gonna do a good service to uh, all of the cultivators or operators within a local jurisdiction. Uh, we would be happy to offer uh, some reviews of programmatic EIRs, both for folks that are writing them and for folks that are being, their project is being influenced by them. Um, 
it was kind of funny. I just got a message on this, our Bilderberg cell phone. Someone just hit me up for an initial study as we're presenting right now, just a couple of slides ago. I don't know if Maya is on the line right now and, and decided to reach out, but you know, every single day people are trying to, are starting to kind of blaze their own path and, and say the heck with the local jurisdiction I'm dealing with. I'm going to make sure I've got security in, in my major, you know, for a lot of folks, their life investment. Um, and on the next slide, uh, as we alluded to, you know, vertical stacking or vertical integration, two different things. Um, these are also, you know, opportunities that could open up by doing your own independent initial study. You could tuck in under, under um, a programmatic EIR or and, and hope that that's going to cover all the activities that you want to do long term, or you can plan to scale and write your own initial study. There's nothing in CEQA law that says that you have to build out to that glass ceiling that Rachel mentioned. You know, you can do your environmental uh, analysis for a big scope, but then you can slowly build out sort of in those phases, as I described in the project description overview. Um, so that's really the, the long and short of it. Um, that's a, a great, I think, overview uh, of all the different areas within an initial study. Um, as Tony, you know, posted a little while ago, you can, we can get in more depth into different issue areas. Please let us know, uh, not just in the chat, if you think of something tomorrow or next week or next month, hit us up, you know, we're, we're pretty, uh, open to having conversations and, and helping folks wherever we can. For sure. Thank you, Scott and Rachel and Patrick. Great job. Um, now we're going to go into our question and answer section. So I will open up the Q&A. Do we work in Siskiyou County? It's a good starting question. Scott's nodding. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, hopefully I'm not uh, saying this wrong, but Shaman's uh, post, will biological and cultural assessments done as part of a minor conversion be able to be used as materials for an initial study? In most cases, yes, but it really depends on the scope of those bio and cultural uh, uh, studies. So if, you're, if you've got a 40 acre piece and they only looked at five acres and you wanna relocate outside of their study area, you may need to get a revision and have them come back out. Um, but usually you are able to, if you've already got the bio and cultural or bio and arc done, usually you're able to use those and build off of those uh, for your initial study. It also depends on how old they are. We've had a couple archaeological assessments that are over 10 years old, um, and they're not able to use those moving forward. An archaeologist has to come back out and reassess since it's been over 10 years. Good to know. Um, if the goal of the farm is regenerative to the environment and creating habitat for natural species, is there a way to balance out that goal with the limits imposed by the Water Board and CDFW? So I think this That's, is going to yeah. kind of depend on your project and depend on what your environmental goal is. If you're, you know, trying to do a small farm and you know, you want a con conservation easement next to your creek, that may be possible with the project, but again, it's going to kind of depend on scope. Um, I know that like in our area, we have a local nonprofit that does lots of projects like this for private landowners and public um, on public lands, but again, scope. Great. Um, what are the steps cultivators should take now in Mendo and Humboldt? Um, is the PEIR likely to be sufficient for transitioning from a provisional to an annual license by the deadline? So for Mendo and Humboldt, so Mendocino, because they're under development right now, I'm really hopeful that they'll be complete by the end of the year and that will be enough time to provide notices of determinations um, Humboldt, for sure, they have been great on their PEIR and providing notice of determinations to applicants. Um, their planners seemed really on top of it when I spoke to them about that transition. Great. Now, I would, um, um, you know, yeah. I, I think doing your bio and cultural for your project specific um, 
I, I think that's something that you can move on right away. I saw a minute ago, uh, another great, great question, cost and time. Um, that's, that's a question that we answer multiple times every single day. How much is it going to cost and how long is it going to take? That's usually the first questions that people ask us. And it really depends on your individual project. Um, you know, uh, typically in more built up places, I saw another question, are there other firms that do this? There's tons. There's tons of firms that do this kind of work. It's just a matter of their availability. Is their timeline going to line up with your timeline? Uh, there's firms all over the state that can take on this work. It's not just us. We're providing an overview. Sure, we'd like to take on more work, but, uh, but there's definitely a lot of firms to pick from uh, out there. You should work with someone that understands the cannabis industry. There's a lot of environmental firms that just specialize in uh, big water plants. That's maybe not the right fit for you. Um, having, I also see something about uh, local firms. You know, it's best to work with someone that knows the area. Um, and if you need uh, support or you need someone to help them translate uh, their background in cannabis speak, that's something that we can help with too. Great. Is Bilderberg available? We're, we're definitely available depending on the location of your project. So give us a, an email. Everyone should have my email who's on here because I invited you here, but you can also email it at, at info at Bilderberg.com. There's also a contact um, page on our website if you prefer to tell us a little bit about your project that way. Um, other questions in here? Can I jump in real quick? Uh, Tony? Yeah. I saw someone, uh, Jared, um, any companies are hiring novice but motivated compliance and project managers? We are, we are one of those firms that are. Uh, motivation is yeah. not something we taught. So that's definitely a value that, that we hold high. Um, we typically try to start folks out um, on a path that they're going to be successful with. So maybe not at a project management level, maybe at an assistant project manager level. And that's a need that we have right now. Just ask Rachel and Patrick. I keep saying we need to hire mm -hmm. someone. So. <laughs> I told Jared to send us his resume, so that's good. Cool. Um, uh, right. I do. I do want to touch on the have you seen situations where jurisdictions are only comfortable with certain firms? So there are jurisdictions like Lake Tahoe that you have to be on their pre-approved list to actually submit, but typically um, you don't. There's not like a com comfortable or required for most jurisdictions. Um, you just have to be a qualified CEQA writer or a qualified biologist, qualified archaeologist, etc. Do you guys want to touch a little bit on the cost of an initial study? I think that is. Yeah, um, cost and time. Um, you know, it depends. In, in some jurisdictions, you're going to find someone that can do the initial study for you and they're going to charge you $50,000. Um, I've seen initial studies cost as much as a hundred. Um, it depends on how far you are from them, the travel time, how many site visits they need to make, uh, the availability of information. There's a lot of things that go into that cost. Um, but for us, we're typically more in like the 20 to 30 range. And that's because we're, we're a boutique shop. You know, we're not a huge firm. We don't have a, a really high overhead. Um, so working with those smaller firms might save you a couple bucks. Uh, again, just want to re reiterate, making sure that folks you're working with understand the industry. I think that that's really important. Otherwise, it can show, you know, blind spots in the analysis. There was a, a gentleman that had an initial study written from, uh, for him. Uh, he hired the, the firm out of Sacramento, and he's up in Trinity County. Um, it cost him a little over 50. And when I read it, I didn't say anything in public because I'm not trying to spike anyone's pro uh, project, but boy, it was not adequate, not adequate at all. There were huge blind spots. Um, and I think that that really goes back to that understanding of the industry. Um, Definitely. Um, <laughs> <I'm not gonna> <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you know, you know. All right. <laughs> Any other questions about initial studies or EIRs? Um, I would say, you know, I just echo what Scott said about uh, cannabis specific because 
there isn't a lot of really great guidance on these different um, areas of the initial study that's specific to cannabis. So um, I think we've done a really good job of creating proxies or different ways of analyzing the data of the site in order to really understand what the impacts are and to clearly communicate them to the jurisdiction. So not to toot our own horn, but we, <laughs> we've put some real work into developing um, industry specific tools for creating initial studies uh, and I'm very proud of that work. Um, can where can we see a SQL writing sample by Bilderberg? Um, we could share one. We'll share one as the um, with the participants of this workshop. So we'll, we'll figure out what that'll look like. It'll probably be a little bit of an overview. Um, and there, we're working on the SQL section of our website, so that might be a potential place where we'll point you to. But we'll figure that out um, and send it out to the participants in this workshop. Thanks, Antoinette. <laughs> Any other questions? I'll wait a minute. And I, you know, this is our presentation, and yeah, we're asking for questions now. But again, if you think of one tomorrow or next week or next month, just hit us up. You know, we've got the forums on our website. You can email us. Tony's put the the general email, I think, in there. Um, we're pretty easy to find. Uh, folks that may have found us on Facebook, we're, we're pretty active on social media. Um, we've got some social media plans coming forward, so we're going to try to increase that, uh, how uh, how much outreach we do. Um, so hit us up. Let us know what's going on. Yeah. Great. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in. I was LinkedIn stalking you guys. <laughs> uh, well, well, we'll work on our LinkedIn presence. Um, I think we do need to build out a page there. Um, we're not new to this, but we are new to um, our broader presence in the cannabis community. So we're working on um, our visibility online. And I just want to thank everyone for participating and for bringing your excellent questions. I will, um, there will be a recording available of this that we will share with you um, in addition to the slides. So again, if you have any questions, send us an email. Thank you for participating today and thank you to our presenters. And that will be it. Thank you. Um,